I first discovered the Sega Dreamcast within the last five years or so, and its library has never really impressed me much. It's not really home to many games from genres I personally have any interest in. As someone with nearly no skills on offer in one-on-one -on -one fighters or racing games, I passed over many titles I read about as I struggled to curate a list of adventure games or RPGs released over the system's short lifespan. Of the few I did set out to hunt down, Skies of Arcadia was always the one I was the most obsessed with finding. Pirates were burned into my mind in childhood, playing The Curse of Monkey Island for many years, and even earlier by Garfield's Halloween special. Playing a JRPG as Sky Pirate seemed like a dream come true, and for the most part, it really was. Skies of Arcadia's enormous plot opens with the introduction of the two main characters, Vice and Aika. They're childhood friends that are a part of a group of air pirates called the Blue Rogues that steal and pillage from members of the opposing faction to support people in need. In the opening cutscenes and the events that follow, their lives become intertwined with another young woman's after they rescue her from a failed kidnapping attempt by the Valuan Empire. I don't want to spoil a lot of the story here because it's one of the best parts of this experience, but the overarching mission follows the protagonists as they race against the Valuan Empire and its armies in the search for the six lost moonstones. The stones are sought by the Valuans to awaken long sleeping giants that once threatened to destroy the world of Arcadia in the distant past. In the wrong hands, they could be used to impart mass devastation, and the Valuan Imperial Armada have malevolent plans for them if they find them first. Any good story is usually supported by great characters, and Skies of Arcadia doesn't disappoint in that department. The main cast, as well as our allies and enemies, have progression arcs, backstories, and complex relationships that shine brightly. There are a long list of characters to discover and interact with, and they go far beyond the usual role of non-playable characters when some of them eventually become recruitable. These many faces augment the wonderful storytelling and world-building, but I do have one gripe. I didn't find a lot of relatable people in this plot, especially not in the main crew. Vice and Ika are at least half my age, and I found the way that they acted and how they spoke to others very grating a lot of the time. In a game with such serious overtones and so much tragedy bursting from its seams, the comedic relief that they were supposed to provide was welcome when it was appropriate. Most of the time, though, it just made me want to send them to their rooms to think about what they'd said or done. More disappointing still was that their antics ripped me right out of serious story moments, a deep cut to this adventure's beautifully dramatic plot. You might think I ended up liking Fina's character, since she's more polite and socially aware than the other two, but her sweetness and naive nature irked me as well. I will say that she did eventually become one of my favorites as her fate shaped and matured her, but if I had to hear her say, let us be thankful for our safety one more time, I was considering turning the game discs into coasters and being done with it. In fact, all of the character catchphrases after battle could only be described as excruciating after the first few hours. It's one thing to have someone say thoughtful things after a tough boss battle to inspire celebration or pride in a job well done, but those expressions were uttered after every single fight. And it's not as if battles were few and far between. Random encounters are at least as frequent as those in what people would consider hardcore RPGs of old. How many times must one endure the countless that was easies or that was funs before the words lose all meaning? While I acknowledge that voice acting was a great addition to games that could support it at the time, the way it was used here only compounded my annoyance with the protagonists. With nobody at the immediate helm drawing me in, I was instead forced to invest emotionally in secondary characters that were more in line with my current self. Looking back, the person I think I identified most with was Drachma in his personal journey. While I think I would have disliked him a lot when I was younger, in the place I'm at in life right now, I guess I just relate the most to a grumpy older man with lots of grief and baggage from his past more than the others. I don't think any of the characters are objectively awful or bad, and in fact, Skies of Arcadia has fantastic character writing compared to many other games I've played from this period in time. I really feel like the people you meet along the storyline will resonate differently with you depending on when in life the game's experienced. I'm sure the brash and adventurous attitudes of Vice and Ika are appreciated more by younger people aspiring to have their own freedom and dreaming big dreams. And in many ways, I wish I would have encountered this game earlier in life because of that. Regardless, there's someone for everyone to lean into, even if they're not directly a part of the main cast. Something that Skies of Arcadia does really well is how it builds up to a completely explorable and sprawling world. I've played a lot of RPGs where you spend most of your time trudging around small portions of land on foot, eventually gaining a means to travel by sea and later on by air to finally get around more conveniently. 
Skies of Arcadia bypasses that early game slog by issuing fast and fun travel through the skies from the very beginning. You can't get everywhere right away, but there's a definite feeling of freedom after the first major story points come and go. There are the obvious places you'll have to venture to in order to advance the plot, but taking a detour along the way might just unveil the secret location or two, or maybe ten. There's also the entire item discovery side quest, where your party can be the first to find tangible evidence of legends from Arcadia's lore, and you can make quite a bit of money turning in your findings at the Pirate Guild's offices. I did find it a bit far-fetched that this ragtag bunch were trailblazers in world research and history making, given how many other experienced air pirates there are, but I digress. I came nowhere close to completing the discovery checklist, but this was a wonderful way to plunge into this universe and deepen the connection with it. Combing through every inch of the overworld for things to cash in on isn't just some arbitrary side quest that adds nothing meaningful to the experience, but instead is the exact opposite. It was also nice to swerve off course for a while to take a break from the main storyline, which can get pretty heavy at times. On the topic of feeling immersed, the visual memory unit for the Dreamcast had a few interesting roles other than just displaying the game's logo like it did for many others on the system. Fina's little friend Cupel, who doubles as her attack weapon, has his very own level up system. You can find champs around places you're exploring to give to Cupel to raise his level. And the VMU acts as a cham detector of sorts. It beeps when you come close to one, and the screen also shows Cupel enjoying his snack when you feed it to him. I didn't even realize that this was a feature until the VMU started spontaneously going off, and like many other small flourishes Skies of Arcadia is stuffed with, I thought it was a very nice touch. Pinda's Quest is a second VMU-only feature, but it's a completely fleshed out minigame side quest. While it's not necessary to play it to complete the main campaign, there are benefits to be had from putting some time into it. You can increase your battleship's level or find additional gold to bring back to your save file, but it wasn't something I ended up playing at all since I had no fresh batteries for my VMU. I thought it was pretty innovative to transform part of a game for a console that's normally tethered to a power outlet into something portable. Stepping into this 3D skyfaring adventure after playing mostly 8 and 16-bit generation games over the past few years was a treat for the eyes and ears. There's so much music to absorb, and since completing the adventure, it's a soundtrack I've listened to often for some peaceful ambience in my day. The music's greatness speaks for itself, working to bring you from the very depths of despair to the heights of soaring happiness while taking in the gorgeous environments in Skies of Arcadia's memorable plot. There's really no comparing earlier consoles to the Dreamcast experience, but the graphics were also outstanding. Except the characters' hands. I don't know when games started getting hands right, but these folks always looked ready to hit the outfield with their fleshy baseball mitts. Anyway, much of the adventure unfolded in outdoor settings with the bright and lush colors of nature to bring locations to life, and apart from a few cave areas where things were a bit dark, everything looked top-notch. The camera often switched between fixed angles or being stationed directly behind the main character for a head-on view. This variety showcased a lot of the hard design work that went into making these places feel polished. I love the panned-in looks of towns and their buildings, and the spacious feeling of larger open outdoor areas. There are always exceptions, and there was one place that did something totally different with the camera that shoved me straight into the arms of motion sickness. As Vice moved around winding paths that weaved upside down and in every other direction here, it was not only disorienting, but also harsh and jarring to the eye, which really affected me. I can understand going for something unique for such a special area, but I think panning the camera out even a little bit would have made some of the turns and flips feel less sharp and would have been much easier on my insides as a result. Exploring cities, towns, and other locations was mostly effortless, save for a few spots where logic didn't seem to prevail while walking around. Some of the more complex cities suffered from this, and the problem was a divergence from convention where outdoor areas are usually connected by outdoor paths. Occasionally, you'd have to enter a building and exit out a back door versus taking an outside roadway to another part of town. The most notably frustrating examples were Horteca and Nasser, where shops or other buildings were also throughways. But it wasn't always obvious that this was the case. I eventually found everything, but it was no help that the mini-map was a complete mess in locations that have a lot of verticality. It shows where you generally are, but it doesn't distinguish which level you're on in places with many layers. The mini-map fills in as you walk around, and while this is usually helpful in games that pop in a fresh map for a new floor, here it felt extremely disorienting. 
If you fill in the ground level of a place and then head upward, sometimes it'll look like you've been to places you haven't actually been to. You really have to pay attention to your surroundings versus relying on the mini-map alone. The depths of caves, old buildings, and dungeons were also visited by the party on the search for the Moonstones, and they overflowed with puzzle-based obstacles. Solving them could open a doorway or radically change the physical structure of the location to make a new way forward. The majority of the time, these were incredibly fun to work through and never felt tedious. In a game like Zelda, you're always thinking in terms of your inventory and how it can interact with the environment. But here, you're looking for patterns and keeping track of the changes around you, sometimes over several rooms within the same dungeon. The question of, how do I get over there, was the center of every effort in these places. But one city in the adventure answered it a little strangely. This isn't an example of exploring a dungeon, but in the city of Maramba, there are quite a few things out of reach on top of buildings as well as a stretch of town that's gated off in the distance. You'll learn a lot about dabus, these essential animals that aid travelers on the hot desert sands, and eventually you get the opportunity to take one out for a spin. I thought I would have lots to discover outside the gate's boundaries right down to the horizon, but nope. The only place that you can walk with it is in the tiny path that they've drawn in on the map between the two parts of the city. I don't know why they went to so much trouble to write in these lovely beasts when they could have just erased the gate and let you walk a few steps, but it was an example of a solution that can only be described as overkill. The enemy encounters in Skies of Arcadia are random. Well, they're supposed to be. The Dreamcast actually has this funny habit of queuing up its classic grindfest of loading noises moments before you're launched into a fight, and it totally annihilates all sense of surprise. I found this comical rather than a negative thing, but it's a funny quirk of the system in general that I grew to love after I realized that my Dreamcast wasn't broken. The console was incredibly loud while loading up cutscenes, and especially during ship battles that we'll get to here shortly. I don't know if it was just my copy, but while struggling to load on occasion, the game would just hang in complete silence, forcing me to hard reset. This happened more than a few times after a cutscene, but before I'd had the opportunity to save, and I lost a significant amount of progress at least twice. The combat in Skies of Arcadia has a lot of features that made an excellent impression on me. It has all of your usual turn-based RPG mechanics, but it excelled with the inclusion of details that I saw here for the first time. For one, each character can equip their weapon of choice and imbue it with one of the six colored attributes. These not only work well against enemies that are weak to that color, but also have a secondary function of giving active party members points towards learning new spells in that color category. Generally, each attribute color has ties to a specific element, but also has the occasional buff and debuff spell thrown into the set. My strategy was to keep a different colored weapon on each character for the categories that I felt were most important to gain skills in. And by the end of the game, I had everything that I consider necessary like bigger cures, attack buffs, and resurrection. It's funny because as robust as the magic system is here, I didn't really use it very often. A second list of special attacks called super moves were much more compelling to me. These are unique to each character and are learned by consuming moonberries that are mainly found in chests. Using super moves taps into the spirit points reserve, a pool that's drawn from by the entire party for various actions in combat. Regular magic spells use up both spirit points and MP, so as somebody constantly fretting over using consumables, super moves became a staple in my strategy since they were more bang for your points. As far as difficulty curves go, using the super moves smoothed out some of the spikes and eliminated the need to grind a lot when tensions ramped up. Ika's Lambda Burst, for example, becomes available early on and is an effective way to wipe out multiple targets at once. Area of effect moves are severely lacking in Skies until much later, and without Lambda Burst or Vice's Cutlass Fury to throw down at bosses and large enemy groups, the hill to climb would have felt a lot steeper. These moves by no means broke the feeling of progression, but I was grateful to have them in my toolkit when I arrived in South Ocean and other places like it. This was one of the biggest hurdles that tripped me up after mostly breezing through encounters on the overworld up to that point. Suddenly, I was being attacked by hordes of creatures that could cast instant death, and their spells were effective nearly every time. Even though party members are automatically resurrected after random encounters end, I experienced one of my first party wipes in this area because of the unexpected chaos that unfolds there. Lambda Burst was the key to surviving, giving me the chance to kill everything else before they had a chance to kill me first. 
As wonderful as these moves were, the CD era of gaming really loved their voiceovers and animations. I think I'll have Fire Consume My Enemies Lambda Burst in my head until I die based on how many times I had to hear it throughout the game. But that wasn't the only tedious thing in combat. Every time you used a super move, they played the same voice clip and showed the same animation. If you're fast enough, you can skip the little cutscene, but if you're not on the ball, you're stuck sitting through the whole thing. Are you stopping to take a sip of tea and have your hands full? You're gonna hear about the consumption of enemies by fire for the thousandth time. My dislike of tiresome voice acting might just be a personal preference, but I feel like the drawn out repetitive cinematics really bogged down the momentum of battle. Even regular physical attacks that didn't have a special animation attached to them took forever to play out in real time. The character would more often than not say something, run over to the target on what felt like the most indirect path ever, execute their move, and then run back to their spot. This was also true for each of the enemy turns in every random encounter, so you can imagine the time it would take to get through a fight with a ton of foes. You might as well go grab a snack and come back while everyone does their thing. I don't know if I've just been spoiled playing games from earlier generations where characters just stand in place and brandish a weapon for a few moments for their turn, but these encounters felt very dragged out with all of these extra visual touches. They were nice the first few times, but I wish there was a way to speed things up after the billionth dance with the same monsters. On the bright side, there were chuckles aplenty in the combat visuals since characters in this generation of gaming always had to be doing something. Apart from the obnoxious constant bouncing in place, melee fighters like Drachma or Vice would stand near a target and swing over and over again between their active turns. And this was complete with grunts and emoting just below the volume of the battle music. These actions never whittled down enemy health and in reality were just there for show, but there was something about seeing them hacking away to no real end that made me laugh out loud every so often. It really made me appreciate the static simplicity of characters and enemies in older turn-based adventures. There were also grandiose ship battles at exciting turning points in the plot, and these were entirely different from any combat system I'd seen previously in Skies of Arcadia or otherwise. They served as some of the major boss encounters, but if you like the challenge of the usual giant monster turn-based experience sans ships, there was plenty of that here as well. While I didn't mind the ship sequences by the end of the game, I got off to a very shaky start with their ins and outs. The manual has a few pages dedicated to how it's all supposed to work, and there are even a few tutorials to demonstrate some of the skills as well. But even with all of that available, I still struggled. My inability to grasp these concepts right away might have been a me problem more than it was an issue with the game, but I was really relying on the manual to help explain everything. There were a lot of gaps between the basics of when you have the best chance to effectively attack your opponent, when they're probably going to strike out at you, and the many different spins on those rules based on the opponent and other factors unique to each encounter. There's some opportunity to learn how to fight well since most subsequent battles build on the ones prior, but they're also just different enough that it can be difficult to apply what you've learned in a new context. For me, these fights went either one of two ways, I'd jump in and win the first time, or I'd choose foolishly and get shot down out of the sky to a horrible doom. The biggest problem I had was making decisions based on vague party observations. They'd break down what was happening and give you two choices that you could pick between that would affect the upcoming turns in battle. Stuff like going for either the head or the legs, or deciding between pulling back or going in aggressively were difficult when I didn't have a full understanding of what was going on. My first time through a fight, I usually couldn't tell which was the better option, so I'd just guess and cross my fingers. There's probably a great walkthrough out there on exactly how to approach every permutation of ship encounter events. But after a while, I was just tired of grasping at straws while trying to put a strategy together. These fights were probably my least favorite part of the game. Another big drawback is that they're extremely long, with some taking around 20 minutes and multiple stages to work through. The long duration I experienced might have been because I didn't always choose the best or the fastest tactics, so people more in sync with ship battle mechanics might see these go a lot faster. There are obviously a ton of different ways to approach them, especially with the acquisition of crew members to help down the line, but I don't want to tread into that territory here for the sake of spoilers around who's recruitable later on. I wish I had had better luck with these since they were such a unique and important facet of the experience. When Skies of Arcadia drew to a close, I came away feeling satisfied. The plot worked itself up to a challenging final encounter, followed by a beautiful ending that provided plenty of closure for the huge cast of characters. 
They didn't go for a cliffhanger that teetered on the illusion of a sequel that would never come, nor did they make any promises that they couldn't keep. All said and done, this was one of the most perfectly concluded video games I've ever experienced. A rarity in a medium where series sequels and prequels are churned out ad nauseum for years in many cases. I've only enjoyed a handful of 3D RPGs to date, but Skies of Arcadia was extraordinary among them. It sidestepped the drab and dire worlds of other games and instead featured a quest steered by a high-stakes storyline that's told through the lives of a light-hearted crew. The camaraderie between the main cast, the character and world-building, and the feeling of limitless exploration made this experience truly exceptional. If I find another game like this in the coming years, it'll feel like I hit the jackpot twice.